Good evening. Good evening. Again, I'm Taylor Tucker, and I am a sophomore at Lawrence Academy here in Bertie County. One of my many goals is to one day practice law here in our great state of North Carolina and perhaps run for a public office. Many thanks tonight to our guest of honor for showing us youth how dreams and hard work can become a reality. With that said, I have the distinct honor of introducing Congressman G.K. Butterfield this evening. As many of you know, Congressman Butterfield was raised here in eastern North Carolina in Wilson. He has been in Congress since 2004 and has fought for things like affordable health care, education, jobs, investing in our rural communities, veterans, and federal programs that support everyday families here in North Carolina. In Congress, Mr. Butterfield holds a leadership position as the Chief Deputy Whip of the House Democratic Caucus. In this role, Mr. Butterfield works with his colleagues in Washington, D.C. to form new solutions to address problems we face today. Congressman Butterfield is the first Democrat from North Carolina to hold this role. From 2014 to 2016, Congressman Butterfield also served as the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, where he focused on promoting anti-poverty programs and expanding economic development and job creation within the African American community. Currently, Mr. Butterfield is a senior member of the House of Energy and Commerce Committee, where he fights for things like access to quality health care and broadband expansion in rural areas. He is a veteran of the U.S. Army and a proud father and grandfather. But what doesn't appear on his biography, though, <laughs> is that when it comes to fighting for equal rights and opportunity, Congressman Butterfield has truly been a lifelong leader. Before he became a congressman, Mr. Butterfield was a lawyer and judge here in North Carolina for over 15 years. I am inspired by Congressman Butterfield and all that he has accomplished. He is a role model to young people like me. We really need more leaders who will listen to the people they serve and fight for what's right. That is what Congressman Butterfield continues to do for us here in Eastern North Carolina. Every week, he takes our ideas and concerns with him to Washington, D.C. and makes sure we are being heard. It is my pleasure to introduce Congressman G.K. Butterfield. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Taylor. You might just be a United States Senator one day. You notice I didn't say Congressman. <laughs> but let me, let me begin by thanking all of you for coming tonight. I, I apologize for the delay in starting the program this evening. I have a chief of staff who just wants everything to be just right uh, before we get started on the program. And so thank you so very much for coming and thank you for your patience. Thank you to the program participants uh, who have given up their time this evening. Thank you so very much. And, to the elected officials, I see so many of you in the room tonight, I dare not begin to call you by name. Uh, I will call my legislative friends by name. Uh, Senator Erica Smith Ingram, who is over there using her iPhone trying to take a picture. Uh, Senator Erica Smith Ingram is a friend. She worked so hard for all of you. Representative Howard Hunter, who's been texting me backstage, telling me about how many people in the audience this evening and, and how uh, proud he was we were able to fill up the room tonight. Thank you, Howard. And finally, to Senator Don Davis. Don is not from uh, this immediate part of the district, but he is indeed a uh, very good friend and, and is chairman of the uh, First District Democratic Party, and he is here this evening. I saw him just a few minutes ago. Senator Don Davis, thank all of you for coming. Thank you to the superintendent and to the principal and to the Board of Education for making this beautiful facility available for this program tonight. And to the sheriff, I don't know if Sheriff Holly is here. I heard he was here earlier and he'll be back later this evening. But thank you, Sheriff Holly, for your friendship and thank you for securing this room tonight. We didn't pay a lot of attention, attention to security uh, up until recently. Uh, but now we're having to be very mindful of security issues, and I just want to thank Sheriff Holly for stepping up to the plate this evening. It's my honor to, to be with you this evening. Thank you for coming. This is my third town hall meeting. My staff has got a real fancy name for this meeting tonight, but I call it a town hall meeting. 
Uh, we started in Durham a few weeks ago and had a packed house at Hillside High School. We went over to Durham on uh, Greenville and had another event, and that was a full house. And here we are for a six-county event here in Bertie County, and we're almost full tonight. And so thank you uh, so very much for coming. Let me tell you about the first district. Most of you already know this, but just in case you don't, uh, the first congressional district consists of 14 counties. You see, our state has about 10 million people, and under the law, we are entitled to 13 representatives, and so you divide 13 into 10 million, and you get the size that a district should be. And every 10 years, the legislature goes into session, and they draw the lines, and they carve the state into 13 districts. It used to be 12, and, and now it's 13 districts because the state is, is growing in size. And so the 13 districts are all across the state, and I am the representative for 14 counties uh, called the 1st Congressional District. The district used to go all the way up to Chihuahua, Perquimans, uh, Pascatain counties, but now because of recent litigation, uh, the lines have had to be redrawn. And so now instead of 24 counties, we have 14 counties here in this district. The district is more compact than it used to be. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a uh, wonderful district. It stretches from Durham, North Carolina, all the way over to uh, Creswell down in the other part, and, and all the way up to a Husky and or Gates County, actually, in Gatesville, here in this part of the state. And so it's been my honor for 13 years now to, uh, to represent the 1st Congressional District. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your love. And thank you for your prayers. I got a whole lot on my mind tonight. I'm going to ask God to guide me as I get through these, uh, these thoughts uh, because a whole lot is going on in Washington. You know that. Uh, you know that quite well because you've been watching the news and, and you care about your state and your country as much as I do as well. And so let's try to get through a few things tonight. I won't be able to do it all, but hopefully we can talk about a few things and then we can open it up. We can open it up for a Q&A uh, later in the program. My job description, if you will, is to bring you information. It's just not enough for me to get on an airplane or Amtrak or in an automobile every Monday morning and, and make my way on up to D.C. and stay there until Thursday or Friday and do the people's work. But my, my job description is a little bit bigger than that. My job description is to come to you from time to time and to, to hear from you and to talk with you and debate with you if you have differences of opinion and talk about the direction of our state and our country. And that's why I'm here tonight to, to hear from you. Certainly I want to talk to you, and I will for a few minutes, but then I want to hear from you. And so my job description is to, to feel the issues, not just to hear the issues, but to feel the issues and to be able to take that experience, those experiences back to Washington and share those and to help formulate my position on issues that are so important. You know, when I was a judge years ago, I would hear a case from time to time, and both sides could be right. And, and I would have to decide, you know, which, which position that the lawyers had would, would be in the, the best interest uh, of the administration of justice. And the same thing as a congressman. It is so difficult uh, to, uh, to, to work through some of the issues that, that we have because sometimes both sides are right. And so I, I need to really hear from you and to, to hear your thoughts and, and your views on the issues that really matter. Here's, here, here's what I need to, to start with. The United States of America, our beloved nation, has about roughly 300 million people. But our world has about 7 billion people. So the first thing, Norman Jerry, how you doing Norman and Jane? The first thing we need to understand is that we ain't the world. Uh, we, we are one twentieth of the world. Less than 5% of the peoples of the world live in the United States of America. 95% live outside of the United States. And so we, we are not the world. Uh, and so we, we've got to be diplomatic and we, we've got to have good leadership because we've got to interact with the world. I did not have the privilege of growing up in a large family. I was an only child. Many of you were not only children. You grew up in large families, and you know that when there are a lot of children around the table, you've got to learn how to get along with each other. Yes, you may have your differences, but you've got to make it work. And so that's the first thing we have to do as a nation is, is to 
make sure that we have a good relationship with the world. If we don't have that relationship with the world, if we want to be an isolationist, if we want to be uh, imperial in, in our views, uh, then it's going to be resented by the 95% that are not on our shores. Uh, some of you watch the news today and you see what's happening in North Korea. Now, we, some of the questions tonight may deal with that. Uh, but we've got, to, we've got to pay attention to the world. The other point I want to make is that this thing called the Congress, House of Representatives, 435 of us. The United States Senate, 100 senators. Those of us in the House, we are from districts that are the same size all over the country, 700,000 people. Um, senators are different. Senators, there are only two senators per state, whether you're Wyoming or Rhode Island or California or Texas. Regardless of which state is at play, you have two senators. But that's not the case in the House of Representatives because we are an apportioned body. That's the way the founders set it up years ago. And so the 535 of us are, are essentially the board of directors for the country. And so we have to go to Washington each week, and nearly each week, and make decisions that are going to affect each one of you in this room. And so the first thing that we have to do as, as a Congress is to make sure that you are safe. Yes, that's job description number one. We've got to make sure that you and your families and your communities are safe. Because if we don't have a good military, if we are not proactive in, in the national defense, the security of our homeland, then those 95% who are not in our country may see us as vulnerable and weak, and they may come in on us and do great harm to our country. And so that is job description number one, uh, to make sure that you are safe. Job description number two is to make sure that, that we have sufficient resources uh, to, uh, to, to make sure that uh, the American people are safe and secure. And the only way, a lot of my Republican friends say from time to time, and they are right about this, the government doesn't have any money. The money comes from the people. The government in and of itself does not have money. And so in order to get money into the treasury, in, in order to provide for the general welfare of our citizens, we've got a tax. We've got to levy taxes on people and on corporations, and we take this revenue into the treasury, and we spend the revenue on providing critical services to the American people. And just as in your church or in your business or in your home, anytime you're taxing and spending, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be conflict over values about how much do we tax people? How much is enough? You know, once we get the money, how are we going to spend this money? Where are we going to spend the money? How often are we going to spend the money? And so that's job description number two, to make sure that we collect a sufficient amount of money and to make sure that we spend it appropriately. The third point I want to make is that this thing called the House of Representatives, 435 people, 240 of us, of the, of the House, are Republicans. 240, do the math in your head, stay with me. 240 Republicans in the House. There are 195 Democrats in the House. Put those two numbers together. There's that noise back right there. I can get through it, but I can do better without the noise. Okay, we'll get through it. Okay, 240 Republicans, 195 Democrats. Put the two numbers together, you have 435 members. It takes 218 votes to get anything passed in the House of Representatives. And so you would say, well, 240, that's a pretty good number. Republicans ought to be able to control the outcome of legislation in the House. The problem is that, yes, the Republicans have 240 votes, 218 are needed. The problem is that as of 2011, about 40 or 45 of the Republicans are insurgents. They are in rebellion to the traditional Republican Party, the Tea Party, if you will. They came to Washington in 2011, they came in pretty strong numbers uh, after the Affordable Care Act debate. They came in, in, in very large numbers. And so 
the, the, the leader of the Republican Party, the Speaker of the House, does not have full command of his conference. Why? Because he doesn't have 218 votes. He has 200 votes. And you've got 40 in the, in the Tea Party that are in rebellion. And so that's why you have not seen a budget pass in regular order over the last five or six years because they have been very disruptive uh, to the process. That's why John Boehner uh, resigned, in my opinion, as the Speaker of the House of Representatives uh, because he didn't have discipline in his caucus. The problem then is that the Republicans, my Republican friends, uh, whenever they run shorter votes, and they are running shorter votes quite often these days, they don't have the, the, the political will to reach across the aisle and to, 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 to negotiate with and to reach some type of deal with the, with the Democrats in Congress. They refuse to do that because if they try to negotiate and, and, and enter into bipartisan discussions with Democrats, and they will be ridiculed and criticized by their base and probably defeated in the next election. And so they are trying to do everything on their own, and they don't have the votes to do it. And so we have not had a budget passed, and the fiscal year runs out on September 30th, which is just a few days away. When we go back on September 5th, we will have 12 legislative days to pass a budget. We don't have a budget. We don't even have a budget resolution which sets the top line, the amount of money that we want to spend in different categories. We have not even done that. And so I want you to pay attention as we go back. We will be debating fiercely uh, the, our spending priorities for the 2018 fiscal year. The other point that I make is that a lot of people don't realize that budgeting in Congress has to be budget neutral, which means you cannot add to the deficit. You just cannot go and introduce a bill and pass a bill that's going to increase spending by millions of dollars. That is not permitted under the rules of the House unless it's called a war in Iraq. Then that goes off budget, you know, and we're now paying the price for that. Uh, but we cannot do any spending that is that adds to the deficit. And so, in order to get the Republican priorities in, 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 in order and, and pass uh, and adhere to the budget neutrality rules, there has to be some juggling of the numbers. And so in order to increase defense spending, for example, increase money for the military, then there has to be cuts on the other side, which is non-defense spending, and that is hurting us severely. Debt limit. Uh, pay attention to that when we go back. I didn't know we had a debt limit before I went to Congress. I plead guilty to that. I didn't know we had a debt limit. Uh, we've got a debt limit, just like your credit card has a debt limit. And when, you, when we reach that limit as a nation, when we, we need additional money and, and the President has exhausted his authority to borrow money, the President has to come to the Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, I need to raise the debt limit. And for years and years under Reagan and Nixon and and, and all the rest of the presidents through the years, every time the president has hit the debt limit, the Congress has agreed to raise the limit in order to meet our obligations. You see, the problem is that we're spending, and I use round numbers when I speak, so if you go on the internet and tell me I missed it by a tenth of a point, then don't hold me responsible. I like to use round numbers. We spend $4 trillion a year in, in funding the government. That's Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the military, Homeland Security, all of the other good stuff that we do, and we do some good stuff in this country. Uh, we, we have the best military on the planet. I think President Trump might have uh, spoken too fast today by talking about he would uh, use that power with fury uh, against North Korea, but we do have the best military in the world. But all of this stuff combined costs about $4 trillion. We take in every year about $3.5 trillion. We run short of money. Uh, it's called a deficit. And the deficit just didn't start under President Trump or President Obama or President Clinton uh, before him, George W. Bush, uh, uh, between the two of them. The, the, the deficit has been ongoing for years. As a government, we have, for 30 plus years, been spending more money than we have taken in every year, with maybe two exceptions under uh, Bill Clinton. And so our debt has just piled up over the years. 
And so always keep in mind that there's a difference between the debt and the deficit. The deficit is how much money you're short for a year. The debt is how much money you have borrowed over a period of time. But now the national debt is $19.8 trillion, and the deficit, when President Obama came in, was one and a half trillion, and as Obama went out, it was a half a trillion. Uh, and so uh, we, we've got some fiscal crises that we're having to deal with. And they're crises, they're problems. They're not Democratic problems or Republican problems. These are problems that Democrats and Republicans have got to work on together. One party cannot do it alone. That is a fact. But the Republicans have in their mind, as an ideology, that the way we're going to climb out of this hole that both parties have put us in over the years, the way we're going to climb out of this hole is cut taxes, which means reducing revenue, cutting spending, and doing away with regulations. That is the mantra, the mantra of the Republican ideology, that we're going to climb out of this hole by cutting taxes and cutting spending. And there's not a mathematician in this country who has been able to make that math work. Uh, the math does not work. What we have to do is to get more people working. It's called broadening the base. We've got to invest in infrastructure. We've got to get people working in this country. We've got to get American corporations who have $2 trillion parked offshore in offshore bank accounts. We've got to get that money back in the United States with the understanding that these companies, if they're given a tax break to repatriate this money back to the country, that they're going to get people working. We have not only an unemployment problem in the first congressional district, we have an underemployment problem. You see, there's so many people who should be making $20 and $25 and $30 an hour like they do over at Nucor, who are making $8.50 and $9 an hour with no benefits and working 29 hours a week. And so when you talk about unemployment, please add that to your conversation, the whole question of underemployment. So because of all of these things, we have, uh, we have gridlock in Washington, and it's not getting any better. I started talking about the debt limit. The debt limit expired last March. President Trump is living on borrowed time in, 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 in terms of the debt limit. Uh, he's been, and, 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 and we did it too, his uh, secretary, his OMB director, Office of Management and Budget Director, has been kind of cooking the books, manipulating the books a little bit, and anyone who does accounting, you know what I'm talking about. They've been kind of moving stuff around, waiting for Congress to raise the debt limit. And before we left town the other day, we got a letter from the from uh, from the uh, uh, Rick Mulvaney, who is the secretary of the director of OMB, who said that if we don't raise the debt limit by August 27, then we will not be able to meet our obligations as a country. The serious business. Well, President Obama went through the same same thing. If we don't raise the debt limit by August, September 27, we got a problem. And so. And so you would think that Speaker Ryan would be able to get 218 votes because he's got 240 of them sitting over there in the corner. You, you, you think you should be able to get 218 people to come to the floor and to vote yes on raising the debt limit. We will vote yes. Democrats will vote yes. The problem is that the Tea Party wants concessions. That they are running the place. The, the, the 40 people in the Republican conference are literally running the House of Representatives. And before we raise the debt limit, I was listening to Tom Cole from Oklahoma on Face the Nation yesterday, uh, who basically says, no, we're, and he's not a Tea Party. He's just a conservative Republican. He's not off the reservation, but he is conservative. Even Tom Cole is saying, yes, before we raise the debt limit, we're going to have to have concessions. And the concessions are about you. They're about rural communities. It's about Medicaid. It's about Medicare. It's about Pell Grants. It's about food stamps. It's about CDBG programs. It's about Title I, President Superintendent, Title I for education programs. That's what they are talking about when they talk about concessions. Is that Emma Johnson? Yeah. Okay. School board, they know what I'm talking about when I say Title I 
uh, funds, that is a big deal in the world of education. And when they talk about concessions, those are the concessions that they want to make. When President Obama hit the debt limit back in 2011, he came over to us and said, ladies and gentlemen, I hit the debt limit, I need some authority. And uh, John Boehner said, you got it, how much do you need, Mr. President? He said, I need two trillion uh, in authority and to raise the debt limit. Nancy Pelosi, my leader, said, okay, let's do the two trillion. When John Maynard took that deal back to the Republican caucus, they went ballistic. They told Boehner he had no authority to go over to the Democrats and, reach a, and the President to reach a deal on raising the debt limit. And that he needed to go back immediately and to withdraw that commitment. Boehner said to him, well, look, I mean, you don't get this thing. The Tea Party, you just got here the other day. We've been dealing with this for years. We, we can't play around with the debt limit because it's going to spook the markets and the stock market's going to plunge and unemployment's going to go up and our bills can't be paid and, and a lot of bad things are going to happen. The Tea Party said, we don't care about that. That doesn't matter to us. We came to Washington to cut the deficit and the debt. We did not come here to vote to raise the debt by one penny. Go back and take it off the table. Boehner went back and took it off the table. And we almost had a crisis. The crisis was, the solution was, and, and, and I guess history would tell us whether Obama made the right decision. I, President Obama was and is a friend. And, and I trust him with, with, with so much. And I, I believe that given the facts as he was presented those facts, he made the right decision. Uh, but his decision was, uh, okay, tell me what I got to do to raise debt limit. They said, cut discretionary spending by $1 trillion mm. over 10 years. President Obama said, $1 trillion over 10 years? That's $100 billion a year. We're not spending the $600 billion in discretionary spending. You want me to cut it by $100 billion per year? Yeah, that's what we want. You want to raise the debt limit? And President Obama, Obama surrendered. He said, yes, I will agree over 10 years to support cutting discretionary spending by trillion dollars. And as he was leaving the room, and I'm adding a little metaphor here, it wasn't actually him, it was his representatives. But as they were leaving the room, they said, whoa, 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 we're not finished with you yet. We want you to cut another 1.3 trillion in spending over 10 years. And here's the way we want to do it. We want a super committee, 12, 12 people. Six Democrats, six Republicans. Six from the House, six from the Senate. Twelve people sit around a table and, 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 and debate how we can reduce the deficit. And President Obama said, well, that may be a good idea for people to go in a room and talk. And then the question became, well, what happens if those twelve people don't agree? What happens if it becomes six-six? And the thinking was that that would never happen. Because the people in the room who were fighting for the military would not want any cuts to the military. Those fighting for food stamps and social safety net programs wouldn't allow those to be cut. And just by the sheer forces of nature, those two opposite ends of the spectrum would be forced to come together and agree and compromise and get something done. It didn't happen. The vote was 66. And it was a deadlock. And the agreement called for it, there was a deadlock, that there would be automatic cuts. A half of it on the defense, which means the military people aren't happy, and half of it on non-defense, which means that social program supporters are not happy. And that was what we call sequestration. Sequestration came in on January 1st, 2013, and it cut $2.3 trillion out of spending for the next 10 years. Don't let you, don't let anybody tell you that Barack Obama ran up the deficit. He did not run up the deficit. We cut the deficit. When he went in, it was 1.5 trillion. When he went out, the deficit for that year was 0.5 trillion. But that is not something to celebrate because it was done in great pain. The 2.3 trillion dollars that we have cut has come with a huge cost and we are continuing to feel it every day and the elected officials know exactly what I'm talking about. All right, now we're back to 2017. Debt limit is coming up again. So the, 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 the fiscal conservatives are saying, we know we cut 2.3 trillion uh, back in 2011, but guess what? This is round two. We are ready for some more cuts. We are ready to come after Medicaid 
And I want you to pay attention to that. And I know my chief of staff is squirming back here because he doesn't like me to get in this lecture mode. But I think this is stuff that you need to hear. Before I'm closing it down in a minute, okay? Uh, this is round two, and, and, and now they're talking about cutting Medicaid. Talk about Medicaid, and then I'll, I will close it out. We depend on Medicaid in Berkeley County. County commissioners know exactly what I'm talking about. This county could not survive. We would be a third world country in Bertie and Hereford counties and the other surrounding counties if we didn't have Medicaid. What is Medicaid? <coughs> Medicaid is a program ushered in 1965 under President Lyndon Johnson that provides health insurance for poor people, low income people, who have dependent children. It provides coverage for the blind. It provides coverage for the disabled. It does not provide coverage for healthy single adults who don't have children. A lot of people didn't know that. If you're single and healthy, 30 years old and you don't have any children, you don't get Medicaid unless you're blind or disabled, have a child uh, who is dependent on you. And so the Medicaid program has been a wonderful program. We tried to expand it under Obamacare. Some states did, some states didn't. I don't have time to tell you that story. But North Carolina is one state that didn't expand Medicaid to include those single folk. And so now they're coming after Medicaid because they see that that's a way to cut the deficit and to reduce spending and reduce taxes. They're coming after Medicaid, y'all. I'm serious. I wouldn't come to you as a congressman and look you in the eye and tell you if it wasn't, wasn't so. They're coming after Medicaid and they're coming after very, very soon. Like in the next few months, they want to significantly cut Medicaid. They want to, to block grant Medicaid. You see, Medicaid is called an entitlement program. We don't have to vote on it every year. It's, it's in the law. It's a right that, that you have if you meet the definition. Medicare is a right. You get 65 years old, it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're Bill Gates or Bloomberg or, or, or whoever. If you're 65, you pay them to Medicare, you get, get Medicare out, Social Security. When you meet that magic age, uh, you can get Social Security. It's an entitlement program. And a lot of these entitlement programs, they're really over two-thirds of our spending in this country. It ain't the social programs that's, that's causing the problem. The, 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 the meals on wheels, that, that's not running up the deficit and debt. It's Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security that's contributing to the deficit. And so Social Security is so important. And those who receive Social Security vote in every election. And so they're not going to mess with Social Security. Social Security is, uh, has a good lobby. They have a good and powerful force in Washington. They're not going to touch Social Security. Thank God for that. They're not going to touch Medicare in a big way. They're going to touch it a little bit. Medicare, they're going to play around the edges with Medicare. But they're coming full throttle, Bond, full throttle to Medicaid because they see Medicaid as being the weakest link in the chain. They feel that poor people do not vote, that uh, they'd rather pick on the low-income people who receive Medicaid than to pick on the middle-class folk who receive Medicare. And so pay attention to the Medicaid uh, issue because it's so important. If we block grant Medicaid, block grant, that means the federal government just gets out of it, just, just takes a chunk of money, a small chunk of money, and gives it to the gives it to Erica and to Don and to Howard Jr., Howard III, rather. Howard Jr. was my classmate in college. That's, I do that by habit. Excuse me, Howard. But, but they, they want to take a chunk of money and give it to the states, a small chunk. Say, so you're on your own. It's like you give that teenager. It used to be a $5 week allowance. I guess it's a $30 week allowance now. It's like you give your, your teenage grandson a uh, a twenty dollar, let's say twenty dollars, no, a twenty dollar allowance each week. He said, "When you run out, don't be coming back to me, son. You know, I'll see you next week. You take out the trash, you do this, that, and the other. Next week, you get your, your your allowance again. Same thing with Medicaid. You want to block grant? Give it to the states. You run out of money. Do bad. You wait next year. But we got poor people down here in Bergen County who need nursing home care. We've got." You know, they need hospice care, they need all of the other. 
the federal government would say, too bad. It's up to the states. And the states don't have the money to support Medicaid. Right now, the state is struggling to balance its budget. And so the first thing they're going to have to do is to cut back on what services you're entitled to. Or cut back on who is entitled to Medicaid. Or they got to cut back on how much they reimburse the hospital and the doctors and the prescription drugs and all of the other stuff. And so there's danger on the horizon, and I want you to pay attention to that. Finally, infrastructure. I wrote that down. I guess I can talk about that. Um, I guess the only one of the few things that I agree with President Don, no, I, I feel him over there. I don't even see it, I can feel it. <laughs> infrastructure. If we can pass an infrastructure bill for the remainder of this year, I want President Donald Trump to know that I will vote for it. If we can invest $1 trillion in infrastructure in this country, rebuilding schools and highways and recreation centers and water and sewer systems and high-speed internet and all the other things that we need in rural America, I will vote for it. But the Tea Party is going to say, we got to find a way to pay for it, and because of that, it won't happen. So I went on and on and on. I've got more on my list, but the Spirit is telling me to stop, and the Chief of Staff is demanding that I stop. Thank you very much for listening.